I think the first thing I would say is for the technical side, what really helped me was not knowing and frankly, not being very interested in that side of it. Because once I got the basics, it's been five and a half years, Harry. I haven't really changed. I have my basic microphone, my free software, my free this. I pay for hosting, but I'm very, very, very basic. And my show sounds great. I'm thrilled with it. My listeners are great with it. My guests think it's easy. I don't send anybody microphones in the mail, you know, and most of my guests are not technical. They are doctors. They are technology. I shouldn't say they're not technical. They're technology companies, but they're insulin pump companies. You know, they're not going to sit in a studio. Keeping it simple has really helped me in terms of my budget and in terms of not worrying about all that and focusing on content. Podcast Junkies, episode 249. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. This is the show where we speak to interesting podcasters and get to learn a little bit about themselves and about their shows. Last week, I had a repeat guest, Christine Blackburn, previously guest number 110, host of Storyworthy. Christine and I connected when I lived in LA, and she's a good friend, a very good host, and very entertaining, and we had a really fun conversation. Make sure you check that one out if you have not already. This week, I speak to Stacey Sims. She's the host of Diabetes Connections, a show that interviews type 1 diabetes advocates, authors, and speakers, and asks them questions about healthcare companies and tech developers in the space. She's a well-known and highly regarded speaker and has addressed groups on topics including diabetes, parenting, and the media. She's an award-winning radio news host and a TV anchor and a reporter with more than 20 years of a broadcast news experience. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash focus right, and the link will be in the show notes as well. Definitely learned a lot in this episode. Stacy and I talked about her background in journalism, the way she structures her podcast interviews, and the importance of above-board ethics and being honest with your listeners as it pertains to sponsorships. She opens up about her son's diagnosis with type 1 diabetes, her career path, and how she's grown as a podcast host. Lots of really insightful information, especially from someone who's got so much experience in journalism. I think you'll really love this episode. As always, full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 249. If you enjoyed this episode or past episodes, I'd love it if you leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash podcastjunkies. Let's not forget that this episode is also brought to you by Fullcast. Fullcast Fullcast.co is the website. If you need help with any aspect of your show from launch to production and marketing, we can help. Schedule a free chat at Fullcast.co forward slash chat 15 about your existing or new show. Make sure you stay to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. Let's get into this conversation with Stacy. So Stacy Sims, host of Diabetes Connections, thank you so much for joining us on Podcast Junkies. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) Do you remember the first time or the first podcast you ever listened to? I do. I started listening to podcasts many moons ago. I was one of the people back in the mid 2000s who was downloading podcasts to my iPod. Wow. And yeah, and I, I was, I remember every single time I would dread it, I would try to put as many in as I could because I was. I'm still pretty computer illiterate Yeah, and finally got my kids involved when they were old enough. But I started downloading NPR podcasts because that's all I knew. I I listened to NPR and I started listening to Fresh Air on my iPod because I had been a listener for many years. And then I started getting all of the other NPR shows that way and very gradually branched out into other podcasts. But it had to be, I'd say 2005, 2006. Those are early days because I remember when I started this show in 2014 and I was really fascinated and I wanted to speak to like the OGs and (laughs) I I got like Elsie Escobar who's Uh. been been podcasting I think since 05, 06 or something like that and Rob Walsh and a lot of the folks, you know, it was just fascinating to learn like how they got started. And I remember the first player that you could play digital music on the iRiver or something like that. It was, it, you could only fit like six <laughs> songs on it. It was really weird. I and went you, right from a Walkman yeah. to an MP3 player. So <laughs> I don't know. And you actually had a, an iPod. So 
which is interesting. I've been listening. I don't know if there's a, you're aware there's a, a new initiative going on called Podcasting 2.0. It's run by the, the site is called Podcast Index, and it's run by Adam Curry. Yeah. So Adam Curry of MTV fame, <laughs> who's uh, affectionately known as one of the, the pod fathers. I think, I think it's he, interesting to see. I'm sorry to interrupt, Harry. It's funny to see your age, you know, as either as your listener or me and Harry, because when you say Adam Curry, yeah. people of a certain age like me immediately think MTV. And many people probably don't even know he was ever on a thing called MTV. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's what's interesting about that story for the benefit of listeners as well is he is the one who he had created an index of podcasts because he was started he's kind of like a hacker type mi mindset and he gave that directory to apple and that's how they seeded the apple directory from like this list of podcasts <laughs> and now it's come full circle because to what's happening with a spotify He's seeing the writing on the wall, like these closed gate, you know, these closed gates are coming in or, you know, these closed systems and closed walls for podcasting. So he's like, no, that's not what it was intended for. So that's why this podcast index has started. So essentially it's rather than have Apple be the, the gatekeeper for all podcasts, podcastindex.org is the site now. So now like a lot of the hosting companies are pulling from podcast index. So it's been an interesting to see the work they're doing. I've been listening to his show as well. So I'm going to try to get him on the show and that'll be full circle yeah. for me as an 80s kid to get <laughs> to, to have a conversation with Adam Curry. That'd be pretty wild. It really is fascinating to look at podcasting, which many of us who've been listening for a long time and the people you mentioned who've been podcasting for a long time, you know, yeah. we feel like it's been around for a substantial amount of time, but it hasn't. It's so young. Yeah, and yeah. to think about how it may change from, as you said, Apple having the directory to a different kind of directory. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, will listeners find that? Will it be for podcasters to play with? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. And I think that's part of the fun right now of podcasting. What's interesting is that they're experimenting with some of these, like, technologies like, you know, I don't know how much you know about crypto and blockchain and, and all these new technologies. But what's fascinating about it, the short version is they're testing out some apps that allow you, while the podcast is playing, to sort of send money in micropayments, like like percentages, fractions of pennies, while the podcaster is, is playing. And there's no PayPal, there's no nothing. It's a direct money that goes to the podcaster. So then there, I've, been, I've been listening because they've been testing it out and it's working. So it allows you as a creator to sort of have that direct one-to-one -one co connection with your audience, which if they can make it simple and have it be on all apps, I think it'll be fascinating to see how that plays out. I'm all for innovation. But all I could think about is how that could go terribly wrong. <laughs> how in your mind would that go wrong? Well, you have a lot of bad players out there trying to fleece people out of their money. And the easier you make it. Yeah, I mean, but it would be for the listener to just support the podcaster. I oh, think I know. I mean, yeah, and that's yeah, fine. Yeah. It's not the mechanics of it, right? I mean, yeah. anybody can Venmo anyone right now. Yeah, yeah, There's just yeah. a lot of people in many different walks of life, not just podcasting, who are looking yeah. to perhaps take advantage of people. Yeah. And, you know, it might be, I'm also a podcaster who doesn't ask their audience <laughs> for, I make money in podcasting, but I don't make it from my audience directly. Yeah. So I see things a little bit differently. I just think you have to be careful. But for some creators and creative creators, Mm -hmm. You know, things like that are amazing. I'd like to see something in podcasting where, you know, maybe instead of sending money or in addition to, you know, you could interact more yeah. or figure out ways to have easier input because you know what happens. People listen, they want to see things, yeah, they want to yeah. hear things, but then they forget 20 minutes yeah. after they're done. Yeah. That's how I am as a listener anyway. I'm like, oh, I've got to jump on that. And then I'm walking my dog and I'm picking up poop and I get home and I'm like, oh yeah, dinner, let's, yeah. let's move on. Yeah. So I think the immediacy part of it would be fun. But especially because, I don't know if you know, Harry, I spent a lot of my career in, in news. Mm -hmm. So I tend to be a little bit cynical, having <laughs> seen not so many nice people. But yeah, yeah. sure, you know, innovation is going to happen, especially around money. Yeah, one of the examples they give is how in YouTube, when a creator's creating a video, there's immediately that chat right in that window. And it's just universally known that like, oh, if I want to engage with my the creator, I can do that right away. And there's nothing yet in podcasting, which is interesting. But I think the more people that look at that sort of stuff, I think there's going to be a lot of, like to your point, a lot of things that are going to be tried. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of money's gone into podcasting as well, which has been fascinating to watch. No doubt. The hundreds of millions of dollars being invested. Amazon just bought Wondery, yeah. which is crazy. I actually interviewed Hernan Lopez a couple of times on the show because we met when I lived in Los Angeles. And so I went to their studios just to see that journey. Like I remember when they launched that, age, that wow. agency. So it's been interesting to watch. But 
when did you start creating content on the internet? Sure. Well, I started blogging yeah. in 2007. Okay. So I worked in local TV and radio news. I was a TV reporter and anchor for many years. I okay. spent 10 years at WBT Radio in Charlotte doing mm -hmm. the morning show. And during that time, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in December of 2006. And my listeners wanted to know a little bit more about it, but we were, you know, news weather traffic station. We didn't spend a lot of time on our personal lives. It wasn't mm -hmm. like a morning show, a wacky, you know, yeah. show where you could talk about stuff. So I started blogging in January of 2007 just to kind of tell people more about what was going on. And I found it to be extremely helpful for me. I think about three people read my blog, <laughs> but it was a wonderful outlet for me to work through my feelings, find other bloggers in the diabetes community, get information. It became a real lifeline for me. And over time, that's what led me to start my podcast in 2015. Okay. I started Diabetes Connections in the summer of 2015 because like a lot of people, who listen to podcasts, I realized that the one I wanted didn't exist and mm -hmm. I had to make it for myself. Funny enough, I had a friend from college who was a reporter in Charlotte, ah. Enrique Correa. I don't know if the, the I name. do know Enrique. I know the name. I mean, I don't, I don't we're not friends. We're, not, we're acquaintances, but I do. Yeah, that's it's a small world. That's hilarious. I, we haven't chatted in a long time, but uh, we were really good friends in, in yeah. college and uh, we actually roomed together in the city when because he lived in the city for wow. a while and then he left to work in charlotte and i went to visit him once as well so i just when you said news reporter in charlotte <laughs> i was like oh wow you might actually know who this we'll who have this to look is. him up later and see we'll check him out on instagram and ping him like hey so <laughs> when you started blogging was it initially about the topic of diabetes or were you just trying to just get the creative muscle you know working and just talking about whatever is top of mind for you well, I was doing a four-hour radio show every day, so I didn't have it. And I had children, so I didn't have a lot of creative muscles to flex at that point. I was thinking this is just going to be a place for me to tell my listeners, here's what type 1 diabetes is, here's what we're going through. But as I did it more and more, it really became a place. I thought in the first year, if you go back and look, I thought it would be more general. Like I talked a little bit about behind the scenes at the radio station and this, that, and the other thing. But, it, you know, I wasn't like I said, I was there four hours a day. I didn't need to talk about it more. And the listeners of that radio station are a much older demographic. If you think about a news talk, your yeah. listeners are probably going to be 55 and up. So they weren't like jumping on the internet in 2007 to read blogs, but my diabetes community was. So after the first year, it became much more directed toward our experiences with type one, mm -hmm. talking about the technology we were trying, the struggles we were having. And there was a really thriving blogging community in around diabetes, especially at that time. So it was wonderful for me. It really helped. I have a question about uh, what led you to uh, decide on journalism to study oh. that. <laughs> I was one of the, you can call it weird or lucky people who knew what they wanted to do in middle school. Mm. When I was in seventh grade, we had a, a large school district. I grew up just outside of New York City yeah. in the suburbs in Westchester County. And I grew up in Yonkers. Oh, <laughs> I worked at WFAS radio. Right I just college. noticed you went to Syracuse. I went to Syracuse for a year as well. Oh my God, Harry. <laughs> Come on. That's, That's crazy. hysterical. Yeah, it's so yeah I grew up in Yorktown Heights. Okay. So the northernmost part of Westchester County. Yep. The community college in that area and I don't remember which, there's so many colleges there. I honestly don't yeah. remember which one it was. They had a TV studio that they placed in my middle school. Oh, wow. So when you took community college classes, and you think about this, I'm, I'll tell you, it was probably the mid, it was probably 1981, okay. 1982, right? Yeah. So a TV station, the equipment was enormous. They probably had no other place to put it. So they stuck it in my middle school and everybody from the district would come around and the college students would be there or different people would use it. And if you wanted to get to school early, you could fool around. They said, here's a half an hour for the middle school students. That's cool. And I was immediately, immediately enraptured. I thought this was the greatest thing ever. I've always liked writing nonfiction. I like reading nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I like news. And to be able to do a 10 minute morning news show once a week for my middle school just really lit me on fire. I was like, this is it. I'm ready to go. And I never wavered from that. I went in high school, I wrote for my school paper and in college, I went to Syracuse University for broadcasting, mm -hmm. and that was it. I interned at a TV station in college. I okay. worked at a radio station. I worked at WSYR my senior year as a weekend reporter. I was terrible, 
I was almost fired every Monday. <laughs> it was really bad. Yeah. But I, I learned and I, I got better. <laughs> I got better. And um, then I got, I got jobs and moved on from there. But it was always fascinating to me. I love talking to people. I love listening to stories. And, you know, being on TV was just so fun and cool. And yeah. that was that. What's your fondest memory? My fondest memory? Oh, yeah. my gosh. I have so many funny memories. I'll tell you a couple of mistakes. Yeah. When I was in college at, at WSYR, mm -hmm. to tell you, the best story I ever did for them that I got the most praise was I did a story in the middle of winter about people washing their cars because it's just horrible up there, right? There's snow <laughs> yeah. and sleet and ice and salt and yeah. ugh. And it was a sunny day and I enterprised the story. I made it up, right? What are we going to do today? I've got nothing mm -hmm. in the assignment file. It's a Sunday. And everybody loved it. And the local TV station picked it up and it was great. So that was really great. The funniest story I've ever done. And I keep nothing, Harry. I'm terrible. I have nothing that I've done in print. I, really? I interviewed Floyd Little, who you know, passed away recently at Syracuse okay. University. And okay. I never kept that article. I mean, I so I'll tell you this story, but I have no tape, but I swear it's true. I was covering... The Oscars in Syracuse, New York. Right? The Oscars. We're always trying to tie things in. What can we do for the Oscar night tonight? I'm working. Sure. It's a Sunday, right? And there was a movie premiere, This Boy's Life, A Boy's Life. Gosh, I can't remember the name of the movie. And it was happening in Syracuse because the author of the book, it was based on the screenwriter. He was based in Syracuse. So I went to the event. There were some actors there from the movie. I was late, as mm. usual. I got lost. I don't remember. I was a terrible reporter. I was, so no one was there. I had missed the whole event. And I'm going, they're going to kill me. Oh, my God. I'm going to lose my job. What am I going to do? Yeah. And I noticed there was a guy just kind of hanging out. And I went over to him. And he looked official. And I told him my tale of woe. And he said, oh, my son's in the movie. You oh, can yeah. talk to him. He's over here playing video games. I was like, oh, thank God. So I said to him, do you ever think you're going to win an Oscar? He's like, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old. What do you think? And was it fun? He's like, it was great. It was such a – and I'm, I don't care if I win an Oscar. I'm in it for the craft. Yeah. It was Leonardo DiCaprio. Are you serious? And I could kick myself for not keeping oh the tape. My God. Right? Because That's years crazy. and years go by, he never wins the Oscar. He gets nominated. He never wins. Can you imagine if I had 10 year old Leonardo DiCaprio going, Well, Stacy, it doesn't matter if I win, it's about the craft. You know, I mean, it was oh, so man. funny. And so that's my favorite. Syracuse story. And I, you know, it's funny, like, when you're in radio and television, crazy, funny things happen and yeah. you just, you just go with it. That is a fantastic story. I'm glad I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked. What, do you have a favorite depiction of the news on TV or the movies? I just, I'm fascinated by it. That Apple TV one with um, Jennifer Aniston that was recently on. Yeah, I didn't watch it. I don't okay. watch a lot of those because they make me mad. <laughs> I just can't do it. First of all, you know, everybody either hates the news, right? Yeah. Yeah, right yeah. now, or they misrepresent it. And I worked in local news too, which is different. Mm -hmm. The best, the best depiction, I think still, is broadcast news, the movie okay. from the mid 80s with Holly Hunter. Oh gosh, William Hurt, I believe is in it. And I can't remember the brilliant actor who anchors the whole thing, who is amazing. It'll come to me. But it's a wonderful depiction of the producer, the reporter, and the anchor, and the broadcast news business. I loved it. Did you ever watch the HBO series, The Newsroom? I watched one episode, and I almost okay. broke my television. I was so angry. <laughs> I was so sanctimonious. <laughs> it was so and sanctimonious. Then, and then there's the classic one from the 70s or 80s, Network? Network? With the classic yeah. line. I'm mad like, as hell! <laughs> I'm not, not going to take, take it anymore. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an yeah. iconic line. It's like anyone... Yeah. I think in the news knows about that. That's funny. And so when did you feel the need or get the bug to start investigating what it would like to, to what it would be like to start your own podcast? I started, as I said, I started listening to podcasts a long time ago and along yeah. the way added more and more and more to the repertoire. And I started listening to diabetes podcasts. I knew people in the community, some of my friends who were bloggers who were starting their own podcasts. And I, I kept listening. And after about two years. And I was busy at the time. I actually had left my morning radio job. I was working as what they call a multimedia journalist. We used to call mm -hmm. it a one-man band. I was <laughs> schlepping a camera. And I don't mind telling you, Harry, it was for the health insurance because my husband has always owned his own business. And this is a long okay. story, but I'll be brief. He yeah. owned a restaurant at the time. We have time. I was the health insurance lady. I'm used to being very brief, you know, these, yeah. these five-minute morning <laughs> news segments. So, <laughs> But he was... Um, 
I was always health insurance lady. I worked okay. full time and had health insurance and he owned his own business for many years. I decided to leave the radio station. I was only sleeping four or five hours a night. I had two small children. Actually, my oldest was in middle school and it was okay when they went to bed at 730. But once they had evening activities, I had to get up at 2.30 in the morning. And it, it really became way too difficult. And after a lot of issues and problems and family discussions, I decided to walk away, which mm -hmm. was hard, but the, definitely the right decision. I don't regret that at all. 10 years is a great time to be in morning radio and to leave on your own terms is, is unusual. So I went as a multimedia journalist and I listened to all these podcasts. I kept thinking, this would be really fun, but I don't have any time. Like, I don't, you know, whatever. And it kept gnawing at me because like most radio people, I I don't know, Harry, I think it's a compulsion with a lot of people. We, we talk back to <laughs> our radios in the car. We yeah. talk to, like, like, you know, you get radio talent or, or podcasting talent together and the conversations just go on and on and on. And my husband kept saying, you're, you definitely need to, you need an outlet. Basically he was saying, please stop talking to me. But he said, you need an outlet. And I thought, you know, there's no diabetes news show. There are a lot of first-person stories, which are wonderful and need to be heard. You know, adults living with type 1 diabetes, sharing their stories, talking about technology. But I kept wanting to ask questions that they weren't asking. I wanted to interview people. I wanted to go further. And that's when I decided I wanted to try. So I started laying the groundwork for it. And then my husband got a job with insurance. Okay. And we said, all right, let's flip the script. You go do that and I'll go do this. And I was intimidated, I won't mind saying, by the technology. Yeah. What saved me was a friend of mine. I was on his podcast. And after I said, Chris, how do you do this? I can talk. I got that part down. But what do you do? And he, he wrote me an email and said, this microphone, this program. Oh, that's great. Go to you know this host. It's easy, but but I had no, I didn't have the language or the access or anything, and that changed everything for me. Once I had that, it was a piece of cake. Does he still have the show? We can give him a shout out. Oh yeah, he actually has different shows now. His it's uh, Chris Snyder and Mark All That Apply. Okay, like checking boxes. Mark All That Apply, yeah, yeah. and uh, that's his current podcast, and it's really good stuff. So it was just talking was the one I was on, but he's I'll put that okay. on hiatus for a little while. So I'm wondering for you, given that you've worked in, you know, you were a journalist and you've had access to like a big team who does all the production for you. And so <laughs> what's been the, now that you've been podcasting for a while, what do you think that would be helpful for new podcasters in terms of understanding the difference? Because I've had people on here that have done radio for years and they think, let's come on with our radio voice. And that really doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> work in podcasting. Or let's take a break now. Or like for, you know, like they put in like a radio break inside a podcast. And I'm just like, no, that's not, like they have all these like tropes and just ways of, you know, short segments. And you, you can tell like they're trying to fit that old format into podcasting. That's one aspect of it. But I'm wondering if there's anything, other things that come to mind, given the experience you've had in journalism and, you know, working on TV and, and how that does or doesn't translate to podcasting? I think the first thing I would say is for the technical side, what really helped me was not knowing and frankly, not being very interested in that side of it. Because once I got the basics, it's been five and a half years, Harry. I haven't really changed. I have my basic microphone, my free software, my free this, I pay for hosting, but I'm very, very, very basic. And my show sounds great. I'm thrilled with it. My listeners are great with it. My guests think it's easy. I don't send anybody microphones in the mail, you know, and most of my guests are not technical. They are doctors. They are technology. I shouldn't say they're not technical. They're technology companies, but they're yeah. insulin pump companies. You know, they're not going to sit in a studio. So keeping it simple has really helped me in terms of my budget and in terms of not worrying about all that and focusing on content. That's been key. One of the philosophies I brought over from radio, and I don't know that everyone in radio thinks this way, but I certainly did, and I was taught this along the way, was put your listeners first. Just put your listeners first in any decision you're trying to make, and the decisions will be extremely easy. And that helps me all along the way. Is my show too long? Well, what do my listeners think? Are they staying with me for most of it? You know, is my show too segmented? Mm -hmm. Is my show too full of commercials? Is my show reaching people? Should I have this sponsor on? Should I have this guest on? These are all, if you just say, well, what do my listeners really need and want? It makes those questions much easier. I will say, if you listen to my first couple episodes, I do spend a lot of time resetting, as we say in radio. 
And that means, you know, when someone's new and tuning into an hour long show, they may be joining you in progress. So yeah. every 10 minutes you're like, hey, my <laughs> guest today is, you know, Harry Duran from Podcast Junkies. And we're talking about this. And thanks for joining us on WSTP or, you know, whatever it is. And I did that like six times an hour. Obviously, you don't need to do that in podcasting. People know why they're there. <laughs> or I can just do it now. For those of you just joining us now, my <laughs> guest is Stacey Sims, host of the Diabetes Connection. That's my first reset ever in, in the show, it's, so that's great. It seems ridiculous to do with <laughs> podcasting, but it's perfectly natural in radio. I do think that podcasters can learn a lot from broadcasters and the other way around. At the She Podcasts Live conference in yeah. 2019, which was amazing, I had a little group that I met up with. I, you know, I said, hey, podcasters. In Atlanta? Broadcasters, yeah, in Atlanta. I was there, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was like, hey, you know, broadcasters, if you're now podcasters, like, let's meet up and have coffee. And a oh, couple cool. of us did turn out. And I just think there's really, there's a lot of value in coming from the professional broadcasting side, you have to leave a lot of those habits behind, hmm. but a lot of what you bring in. And I think you mentioned commercials and things like that. And if you're skillful and you work at it, I think there's a lot of ways that we can do that better than a lot of podcasters who do not know. And there's no knock on that. I mean, how would you know if you've never done it before, how to do a commercial, how to leave yeah, yeah. yourself a little bit of space. So if you ever want to change it, you can, you know, what goes in a commercial? How can you not make your 30 second commercial that you sold four minutes long because you just don't know, right? There's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of skills, so I think we just need to talk to each other more. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in this day and age, mm. I want to circle back to something that the listeners probably dying for me to ask, and it's why and how the topic of diabetes is important for you. So the backstory around that, I think will be very helpful. And then we'll come back to a couple sure. more follow-ups on podcasting. So can you tell us that story as well? Sure thing. And if you don't mind, this is where I get out my soapbox and talk yeah. about diabetes, <laughs> because I do like to educate. There's a lot of misunderstanding about it. As I said, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in December of 2006. He was not yet two years old. Brief explainer. Type 2 diabetes is very different than type 1 diabetes. And let's just talk about it real quickly in general. So diabetes means that your body is not breaking down glucose from food properly, right? We all eat. That's how we get our energy. But you need insulin produced by your body to then break down the glucose, use that for energy. If not, the glucose is just basically swimming around your body, slowly poisoning it. I mean, it's, it's no joke. So type 2 diabetes means that your body is still producing insulin, but for whatever reason, it's not using it correctly. So the glucose still isn't being broken down. It's slower. It's not as deadly as quickly. In type 1 diabetes, which used to be called juvenile diabetes, but you can get it at any age, with type 1, your pancreas is not producing insulin. I mean, maybe little drips and drips here, but it's not producing enough insulin. So you must inject or infuse synthetic insulin every time you eat, whenever your blood sugar is high, you know, all the time. It's really a balancing act that isn't even day to day. It's hour by hour. It's really a unique autoimmune condition. It's hard to think of something else that a patient is sent home and told to manage as much as type 1 diabetes. So it's a real lifestyle change. It's not about eating better and exercising. My son and can eat lifelong? lettuce all day. It's lifelong. Yeah. You know, he can eat lettuce and run marathons. He'll, he'll still need insulin. There's other types of diabetes. There's gestational. There's, Mon there's Modi. There's all these different kinds. The other one I want to talk about briefly is just called LADA or 1.5, and it's latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And I like to bring it up because it is misdiagnosed so often and for so long, it really causes a problem. So if you're listening and you've been diagnosed with type 2, but you are thinner, you have no family history, and you're doing everything your doctor says, including taking medication and your A1C, which is how they measure it, still isn't coming down, pretty please ask your doctor about LADA, also called type 1.5. 30% of cases are misdiagnosed and they are misdiagnosed for between five and 10 years. So wow. that's the soapbox. Yeah. And that's all the stuff I've learned from the show. I mean, selfishly, yeah. it's been such a great education for me. I started getting into it because of my son. And when you are a mom of a toddler with type one, it's just bananas. I mean, you yeah. figure first you're trying to give shots, then you're thinking about an insulin pump, and then you've got to check blood sugars all day long and all night long and what to eat and how to go and what are we going to do at school. And so I wanted to learn from these other people and I didn't start the show, like I said, till 2015. So that meant he was 10. Okay. He was 10 when I started the show. And then as you start going into these communities and, you know, obviously 
online forums. You, you never know what you're going to hear from there. One thing that I noticed when I was looking at your profile is that at one point someone labeled you the world's worst mom. <laughs> is that <Yeah>. correct? <laughs> I took that title for myself. Um, yeah. So like any, you know, it's parenting, right? Yeah, it's yeah, all these parenting yeah. groups. And we all think we're, everybody else stinks. And there's this whole myth of perfection in parenting. Well, then take that to parent a child with a chronic condition. And, you know, not only do we get inundated with people outside the community saying, hey, have you tried this drink or if you only try cinnamon or have you tried the paleo diet or, you know, how about acupuncture? You know, and then within the community, if you don't do it this way, you're doing it wrong. There's a lot of fear, as you can understand, and there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of compassion and wonderful support, but there's there's dummies just like any place else, right? Judgmental people. And I think a lot of that does come from fear, though. So I was in a chat talking to people. There's a lot of closed Facebook groups, which is where I mostly have these conversations. And I was talking about how we did things. And I don't give medical advice, but I do talk about our personal experience. And this guy would not get off my back. And he thought I was doing everything wrong. I was a terrible parent. And he just said, you're going to kill your kid. And I said, I must be the world's worst diabetes mom. And I slammed the computer shut. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I went back and I thought I got to get, I just, I, I actually copied the conversation, but then I deleted myself. Okay. Because I was like, this is ridiculous. Why yeah, am I yeah. arguing with this guy? This is not a good situation. He's baiting you. He's baiting me. I didn't like that I rose to the occasion. But the world's worst diabetes mom put a little light bulb off in my head because I've been meaning to write a book for a very long time. And I didn't want to just put my blog posts all together because that's boring. And I thought, perfect. I'm going to write a book about all the mistakes we've made and how my kid is great because of mistakes. And that's actually how I parent both my kids. I don't know mm-hmm. about you or your situation, but- I learned from mistakes yeah, yeah, and it's been a wonderful way to parent and my kids are 19 and 16. So there's no finish line, right? We never really finish parenting, but I have a degree of confidence now, certainly about elementary school and middle school. <laughs> and I can say being the world's worst mom and the world's worst diabetes mom gave my kids a really good elementary and middle school experience. And that's the name of the book. That's the book, the world's worst <laughs> diabetes <laughs> yeah, mom. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> that's great. Thanks for sharing that story. Uh, oh my goodness. So now coming back to podcasting, when you started, did you have in mind a format? Did you think it was going to be solo content? Were you immediately thinking about interviews? Did you know you were going to do sponsors? Talk to us about like that, that first year. I decided that I would base my show off of Fresh Air, the first podcast that I listened to. That's funny that you asked me about that. I decided, and I actually do still reference that I say sometimes like, hey, it's Fresh Air for people who use insulin. So I decided to, yeah, I decided to model it after that show. So I did put a little bit more in the beginning, kind of like a welcome, you know, than Terry Gross does. And a little bit. I was about to ask you if you had a Terry Gross impersonation. No, I don't. (laughs) I don't. (laughs) That would be funny, though. (laughs) I do have an NPR impersonation, though. Welcome back to Diabetes Connections. And then I play some jazz music and then I only let the interview run for 10 seconds before I come back on. If anyway, you're just I'm, not a big, I'm not a big fan of their interview <laughs> style. But I decided it would be interview. I wasn't thinking about sponsors early on. I actually thought I do a talk. I do, I speak in the community a lot and I did before the podcast. And the idea I thought I would do was a show about connections. I called it Diabetes Connections after a talk I give. I give one about how to find people in your community, how to reach out, how to, how mm. to make in person and now over Zoom connections because we cannot do this alone. It's very difficult and you need a community. So I thought, oh, the show will be about connections. I'll ask everybody, like, how did you meet the first person in the community? You know, after three shows like that, I realized this is not, that's it. That's all you can do on that topic. Move on. So I kept the interview format and made it more news information, inspiration, with a very big focus on technology. So if there are new insulin pumps coming to market, if there are questions about continuous glucose monitors, I talked to, I actually talked to the insulin companies, and I've been able to say, why are your prices so high? This is terrible. Things like that. And I, I've kept the format relatively the same. I add, as I've added sponsors, and I'm happy to talk about that if you want, I've added branded segments um, that I try to keep, again, what do my listeners want to hear? So I have segments right now called Tell Me Something Good, which is community solicited. I get okay. from my listeners, you know, good stuff. Give I me like your that. good news that ha- pertains to diabetes. And I do one called Innovations, which is everything from, you know, diabetes hacks, tips and tricks to the latest and greatest news and innovations that are coming out. But that's quicker. It's not an interview segment along with the featured interview for each segment, for each show, excuse me. 
So let's talk about sponsorships. Did you know that you would be doing it early on? And did you have a model to follow? And how did you get those, those first couple? I, I didn't think about it right away. It was in the back of my mind. But my thinking was, let me get this off the ground and see what happens. I'd never been paid to blog, but I had been paid to speak. And I had been paid to do that by a company that made me a community blogger. So it was an unpaid blogging deal, but it was a paid speaking position, if that makes sense. They would send me out occasionally. And that was really fun. So I thought, okay, if I can get these guys, and it was Animus Corporation, which was part of Johnson & Johnson. The company okay. unfortunately no longer exists, but Animus made a fantastic insulin pump that we used. So about three months in, when I felt like, okay, I'm going to be doing this, this is going to work out, I decided to approach them for sponsorship. And I didn't have a model. I didn't have a podcasting model, I should say. I decided to approach this like I would have from my years in talk radio. And I was not a salesperson in talk radio, but I was the talent for the ads and I knew the process. So what I decided to do was not sell my numbers because they were really lousy. I think I had a, I mean, I shouldn't say they were lousy. They were low, right? Yeah. Lousy's relative. They were low. I had about 125 listeners per episode after four weeks, which I didn't even know was a metric at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I knew, though, that those were very, very valuable listeners because, and this is again from talk radio, you may not have the most listeners, but you have very valuable listeners. They're older. They have a lot of money. They want to spend it. They're looking for things like that. And I knew that host read ads were the way to go because that's what works in talk radio. If you give a personal endorsement, it means everything. Luckily, you didn't have to relearn all of that stuff. Yeah. So I approached Animus, and my marketing contact understood, even though we had to explain podcasting again and again and again. She got it. And we worked out a very inexpensive run. And I said, you got to be on, again, I learned this from radio, you got to be on for three months, minimum. You're not doing anything less than three months. It's not good for anybody. And they wound up coming on for nine months, because that's by the time we got the contract set, that's what they were, they wanted, you know, these bigger companies want to sign on for a year. They don't want to yeah, do yeah. week by week. Yeah. So we said, okay, we'll do nine months by the time it was done. And she signed the contract and everything was great. The best part was it went to compliance. Now, this is Johnson & Johnson. I don't think they'd ever sponsored a podcast before. And they looked at it and said, what did you do? What is that? What? Who? Stacey, what? What year is this? And this is the end of 2015. So it would have been for 2016. Okay. Okay. And she said, well, we signed the contract. God bless you, Bridget. You are the best. You saved me. So they signed the contract. They had to figure it out. It's a medical company. So we had to go through a lot of compliance and legal. And I, I don't want to bore you and your listeners with the details too much, but basically I worked at a system where I wrote a lot of commercials for them because I wanted it to sound spontaneous. So hmm. I wrote like six to eight commercials. Okay. And, you know, hey, we love this pump and my son Benny uses it. And here's all, let me tell you the funny time that he jumped in the pool with his insulin pump yeah. on or, you know, spontaneous things that their legal department could get, then go through and approve. So I didn't have to worry about that week to week. And after that, my husband said to me, you need to sit down and make a business plan. Hmm. And I was like, I don't really want, no, I, no, it's my fun thing. Don't do that to me. And he said, do it. You really should to take this seriously. You're doing great. I said, okay. So I wrote on a piece of paper. Here's what I want to do. Here are my goals. Here are my sponsors. And I made it happen. And it's been really, really interesting. I love doing the show. I would prefer to just have ma money magically fall from the sky if I had to choose, you know, doing the show or going for sponsors. I'm not a born salesperson. But working with the sponsors has allowed me to the freedom to do the show and take the time to do it. And also, I, I can't ask my listeners for money. It's not that kind of show. They spend way too much on insulin and diabetes yeah. supplies. If they're going to give to a charity or a diabetes group, it shouldn't be to me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ever ask them for money. So it's been really fascinating. So because this is about podcasting, we, we, mm -hmm. are, or we can get as geeky <laughs> into okay. the details <laughs> as we want and go as long as we want. I'm curious, are you at liberty to share how much that first sponsorship was for or, or a ballpark? Yeah, I sold that for $110 an episode. Okay, a week. so that's great. Yeah. yeah. And what I, I did was I, I created, I'll give away the store. I basically created a model where I said, if you buy for three months, it's this much. And then I discounted, you know, as they went. I personally think, I mean, look, I know people don't like to talk about money. It makes people nervous and that's fine. I don't think anybody should be selling a podcast sponsorship less than $100 a week. Yeah. I don't think it's worth your time as a creator. Yeah. I love it. It's This is exactly in line with what I've done on my show. And mm -hmm. I usually tell people, you know, start at 150. And then to your 
but tell them that that's the per episode. And then it's a, if you do a month, it's this. And then if you yes. do three months and then when they'll see the three months get some like that 40% discount. So it's almost a no brainer to like, oh yeah, easily I'm going to do the three months. I always tell people coming back, like this, this is circling back to shout out to Jessica Kupferman of She Podcasts because she had an ad agency, which she then sold to, to Heather Osgood of True Native Media. So I would pick her brain about all this stuff early on. <laughs> and she she really nailed home this concept of the platform approach. Mm -hmm. And the platform approach is like, you're not selling. And this is exactly what you were saying. Like, you don't have the downloads early on. So don't even bother going down that route, but say, hey, I've got dedicated listeners on a topic they're passionate about. And by the way, if you're at that point, you're starting to build up your social, this is my email list. This is my followers on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever it is that, you know, this is my website visitor, like whatever metrics you can pull in. And when you do that, then you, you're telling a better story. And, and you know, what you're saying is, is in line with what we talk about when we launch shows for clients. I tell them from day one, because we launch shows for businesses, I'd said, even if you don't know what you're going to sell, like put that ad read for your own business, like literally like on your first episode. So you get into the habit because as you might, you know, you could probably speak to this, but it takes you a while to find your, your sponsorship voice as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great point. A lot of people will say, well, you have to get your listeners used to it. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think if you're skillful and your listeners are with you, they're going to understand if you start adding ads here and yeah. there and you do it well. But for your own skill level and your own comfort, yeah. it's a wonderful thing to be able. I mean, I had no, my business is the podcast. So I wasn't promoting anything else. I, I was thinking about that when I launched, like, should I put something in here? Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I didn't need to. And then when I started doing the ads, I really wanted to make it personal. Like I said, that was very important to be able to add yeah. that spontaneous sounding personal touch because otherwise, why, why me, right? Why would they bother to advertise with me and not with somebody else? So to be able to speak to that and practice that. I think is a very good skill. And I think it's difficult, you know, if you're getting into podcasting because it's fun, it's a hobby, or it's an extension of your business, you know, these are not skills that anybody expects you to have, right? I mean, it's asking quite a lot. It's yeah. enough to say, oh, look, I'm finally going to talk to this microphone. Is anybody going to want to hear me? You know, <laughs> we've been, I've been doing this for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was about to say 25, 30 years. I don't even know. Yeah. My first paid radio job was in 1992. Okay. So it's been a bit. <laughs> and, you know, you don't think anything of it, but I have a lot of friends who are getting into podcasting and, you know, it's nerve wracking to speak. So to do an ad is a different skill set, especially now when we hear people talking about, oh, dynamic ads and all these different things. And you're going to want to go back and replace them in your catalog. And well, how do I make sure I can do that if I'm trying to make it an organic part of my show? You know, how do I differentiate? This is also really important to me. I, I've pitched several times. I've never done this talk. Here I am pitching it again. I would like to do a talk or be on a panel about selling your show without selling your soul. Mm -hmm. I think above board ethics help you help your show, help your listener. You can still make money. Don't be a sleazeball. Disclose. Talk about sponsorship with your listeners. My listeners know the deal. They know who I endorse. They know why I endorse them. And they know if those people come on the show, I'm still going to ask them hard questions. Is there bias there? There has to be. They are paying me. Yeah, yeah. I can't, you cannot get rid of that. But I have, I'll give you an example. Dexcom is a company that makes a continuous glucose monitor. It's this awesome piece of technology. You stick it in your arm. A little wire goes on your arm and there's like a bump above it. It looks like a, almost like a nicotine patch. That's a terrible description of it. Anyway, so it reads your glucose, though. It reads it from the interstitial fluid under the skin. So instead of poking your finger 10 times a day, you look at your phone. I can see my son's blood sugar right now oh, on wow. my phone. It's amazing. <laughs> so Dexcom came on as one of my sponsors several years ago. I love them. There are problems. It's a technology company. you know. So I have to be able to say to them, look, I think your inserter looks like a torture device. Are you guys going to change that? And not because of me, but they did, okay. right? Why don't you go yet from the device in my son's arm directly to an Apple watch? Why does mm. he still have to schlep the phone? You know, what's the timeline? So I can still ask them things. Yeah, like yeah. That. But long story short, I really think that there's, when you're talking about, I forgot what your question was, Harry, but when you're talking about podcast sales, and I get very excited about this, I do think that it's important to keep the ethics in mind as well, because yeah, yeah. you really can do well and do good if you're just smart about it and take a minute to think about it. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure if anyone's listening and looking for content for the, an upcoming event that, that that title sells itself selling a show without selling your soul so that's gonna be good it's funny and i think you can probably speak to this a bit more but the types of relationships that you're building with sponsors 
are more meaningful. And I'm assuming that's the feedback you've gotten because they're happy. If you mentioned this one sponsor has been re- with you for three years, so they like what you're doing. They've probably seen the results and they appreciate the fact that you're passionate about the product and also willing to speak up when, you know, that there's something that you feel needs to be expressed about, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. I think I've been really lucky. Again, I'm not afraid to be forthright with my sponsors. I do have a good relationship with all of them because I'm very upfront at the beginning. You know, they know what they're getting. They know what they're not getting. I think one good piece of advice, and I've learned this the hard way. Luckily, I learned it in radio and not podcasting, is be careful of what you accept for free. Hmm. I actually, here, I'll give you the punchline to the story. Yeah. After all those years in radio, I had to implement a rule. I would only accept something free to a sponsor if I could physically remove it from my house myself. No siding, no gutters, right? I would accept uh, certain products if there was a time limit or, you know, if it, I guess food. I'm trying to think of what I would think of. When I had LASIK years ago, you remember everybody in radio was getting LASIK. Yeah. They were all getting it. it for free. I insisted on paying. I said, you can give me a discount. I paid $500, which was deeply discounted. But I said, what if something goes wrong? I can't return my eyeballs. So you need to kind of protect yourself from people who are going to, sometimes taking free stuff is a bigger hassle than it's worth. Yes. So because we're talking about medical equipment and other people in the space do this, no fault to them, that's fine. I do not accept on an ongoing basis, I'll take something for review, but I will not take insulin pump supplies for free, the CGM stuff for free, pharmacy stuff for free. To me, there's only a downside to that. In the short run, it seems great. Oh, I'm getting free stuff. But what if something goes wrong? What if I want to say something about it? It just isn't worth it in the long run. So be very careful about what you take for free. I know most people are getting like, you know, a dinner or, you know, a mattress, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you know, maybe it's, if it's something bigger or something permanent, be careful. Well, it's, it starts to go down the slippery slope of like the pharmaceutical rep, you know, schlepping the, the, <laughs> the drugs we can't pronounce because they ran out of normal sounding <laughs> words in the English alphabet, <laughs> you know, with disclaimers that would scare anyone when you hear them on TV. <laughs> like, yeah. So that, you know, and definitely don't want to go down that route. Yeah. You got to be careful. It's just a question of, just thinking for a moment about it and having these conversations. And once again, what's best for my listener? It really comes down to that. So I I would imagine that improving your skills as a host is something that you can, it's a continuous process for you. Specifically as an interviewer, how have you grown? I think what's one place that I've grown is in really letting my, my interviewees breathe. I am less afraid of silence than I was in the beginning. I love that. Yeah, really listening, not being afraid to take it down a notch. You know, I get very excited sometimes when I'm talking to like, especially when I talk to celebrities with type one, you know, I get all excited and nervous, you know, or athletes or whatever. And especially there are a lot of topics, I mean, I bring up athletes that I don't know a lot about. So something like Mark Andrews is a player in the NFL who lives with type one and he plays for Baltimore and he's just a great guy. And I've had him on and I feel like such a ding dong because I don't know enough about football to ask him. So I get my listeners, give me questions for him. They're like, what do you want to know? I ask him things like, what did your mom think when you went low? Well, I love football that. Game? <laughs> you know, whatever. But, but I think letting people take time to answer will sometimes give you better answers than if you keep interrupting, especially the hard questions with people who you know, are used to kind of running the show themselves. Or you can just say things like, what do you mean by that? Or, you know, letting it breathe. Also, this year, this past year, and I've had this, hmm. All right, I'm going to go down this road. So the conversations we had this past year about race, right, were the beginning of conversations for a lot of people. I've done several shows in the past several years about we have a problem in the diabetes community. Every conference is all white people. We don't have enough diversity. I'm a Caucasian Jewish woman. I am very well represented in the diabetes community. My son, with a lot of Jewish families, unfortunately, there's autoimmune in the community, Mm -hmm. the Jewish community. So we see it. He never felt other. I never thought about it, really. And then four or five years ago, I started talking to more friends about it. And I've done several episodes. But this past year in particular, we really started listening more, talking more about it. And one of the things that I have a problem with as an interviewer and as a podcaster, I feel weird bringing it up. Hmm. I wonder all the time, am I doing this right? Am I speaking the words right? Do I sound like a dummy? And I think that the best way to overcome that is to just be sincere, admit it's hard, 
and keep trying. I had an interview just recently, and it's a really, well, I think it's very interesting. It's with a new insulin pump company that's in Europe, and they may come to the United States. And when they do, they will be partnering with Lilly Diabetes, which means they'll be the only insulin company in America that can only use one type of insulin, okay. which is very controversial because not every insurance company covers every type of insulin. But when, during our conversation, they're a Swiss company. He said, and we have this cool skin-colored patch. And most patches are white, 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 not even Caucasian or peach colored. They are just white because it's medical stuff. And he said, skin colored. And I said, what color skin? And he was like, what do you mean? We're Swiss. You know, I mean, it was really, and I said, well, if you're coming to America, yeah. your first order of business is to have a palette. You've got to have brown, you've got to have darker, you've got to black. And while I was asking him, Harry, I felt so awkward and stupid and weird it's the right question to ask. It totally but for was. Some, but for yeah. some reason, because any conversation about race is hard, I laughed a little. Like I felt I was trying to put him at ease. I didn't yeah. know what he was going to say. Yeah, yeah. And he was great. He's like, we didn't think of that. We got to get on that. I mean, he really embraced it. Yeah, kudos to them. Though. I don't know if he'll be able to do it. There's a <laughs> lot of skin colors. but yeah. And I think that that's a long-winded answer to your question to say, it's okay to feel awkward and go for it. Mm. Don't cover it up. Try Yeah. Try, 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 try. And if your listeners know, and actually after that interview, I do segments in my show. So after the interview, I always come back and say a few things about it. And I said, didn't I sound like a ding dong? Like, I didn't I sound awkward? That was tough for me. But I hope you took it in the way it was intended. I don't think I said ding dong. I hope you took it in the way it was intended. And let's continue to have these conversations. I got great feedback. I got great feedback. I Even love though that. I sounded awkward. Don't be afraid to sound awkward. Yeah, it's so important because I think otherwise, how are you going to grow? You have to yes. continuously push yourself to the edges of where, of discomfort and yes. say, like, I've never done this before, but I think, you know, you, that instinct that you had to say something was the right one and acting on it, even if you didn't have the words formulated or, or feel like you were in a position, you know, to be an advocate. But I think this is the whole point. And, you know, a lot of the topics, I'm Latino, but I mean, for the most part, I've been called everything from Greek to Italian to like, <laughs> you know, uh, a whole mix. But it's just this idea of being an advocate and speaking yeah. up when you have an opportunity to say something for a, you know, a portion of the population that's been disenfranchised. And I, and I, I love that story. I think it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. It's one of the wonderful things about podcasting in that you really can be less than perfect if you're yeah. trying and you're genuine mm -hmm. and you're open. It's not when I was in broadcasting, you know, God forbid you made a mistake or you said something awkward or it really, it's a very different look, yeah. right? You're perfect anchors and yeah. we're here in our perfect clothing, reading the perfect teleprompter that somebody else wrote for us. But in podcasting, your audience knows you are you. And the more genuine you are, the more open you are, even with your mistakes and your fears, mm -hmm. I think the more that they embrace you. It's been wonderful. It humanizes you. Oh, yeah. Like I tell people, like I'm not. You know, the heat is on right now, so you, you could, you, it'll probably come through, but I'm like, you know, there's the <laughs> trucks backing up all the time. Yes. And, and the beauty of this show is like, the, we are, I talk to other podcasters, so we're not going to fake, you know, being NPR. Like, I've had dogs jump into the laps of guests and be like, oh, and they're like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, like, what's the dog's name? They're now yeah. on the show. Like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so they make a guest appearance and it's just it. the, the reality of podcasting. A couple of questions as, as we wrap up. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I'll give you a real one and a silly one. Yeah, yeah. I've changed my mind about video. I, uh, and in podcasting, I had a very strict line of no video because I felt that it changes the conversation when I can see you and you can see me. We communicate slightly differently than if we can't see each other. It's subtle, right? Little looks and things like that. And I felt that if I was communicating over video, but not sharing that with my listeners, they would be missing out somehow. 2020 changed that because everybody got on Zoom, everybody got on Squadcast, everybody got on StreamYard, everybody got on different things. And in real life, we looked at each other and we got also, you know, I come from television, really. We got used to no makeup and everybody being casual. It's really hard for me yeah. to appear on camera without lipstick and brushing my <laughs> hair because I come from that old school. Listen, I started in television when we had a written down rule. You had to wear pantyhose and closed toed shoes. I'm oh, old. Man. So, and I'm not even that old, which is yeah. crazy that they had that rule in the late nineties. I mean, come on, but I've really changed in that. I do more video interviews and share them. Now, my big problem is I will share 
like next week, my show has an audio interview and I also have the video interview, but I edit for things like long pauses or, and during this interview, we kind of said at one point, like, what do you want to talk about next? Or where are we going? Yeah, and it was yeah. a friend of mine, but we had some stuff to talk about. And then I realized I got to edit the video too. <laughs> oh no, I should have edited the, vi- edited the video first and yeah. then just taken the audio from yeah. it. So next time. Yeah. But maybe, maybe the, the key there would be to put like uncut in the, in brackets. Like when you do right. the video, like, look, you're getting the raw video there. You know, if you want the, if you want the, the polished <laughs> version, listen to the audio. Right. The audio. Yeah. So that's one thing. I, yeah. Although I do like audio and video editing. I enjoy that. And the silly thing was, <laughs> so this year when we're all stuck at home trying, I don't know if you drink, I'm not a heavy drinker, but you know, there's been a lot of wine and things this yeah, year. Yeah. I went, I discovered bourbon. So oh, okay. I went from like vodka tonic and now I'm a bourbon drinker and I think bourbon and ginger ale. That's okay. Really Any That's specific brand? I don't know. I have no idea. My husband would know and he'd be very embarrassed <laughs> that I don't, but I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I've had an appreciation for uh, whiskey thanks mm. to my girlfriend. So, <laughs> What's the most misunderstood thing about you? I'll give a little bit of a cop-out answer here. And I think it's the misunderstood thing about my show in a way. When people meet me, and we talk and we have some fun and everything. Oh, it's great. You're podcasting. And then what do you podcast about? Like, what's your show about? And I say, oh, type 1 diabetes. Oh, oh. And it's like, immediately I get pity. People are sad for me. Oh, or you must be a saint, right? You're sh- oh, what a public service. It's funny how, you know, not doing a comedy or an entrepreneur show or whatever, doing a diabetes show has kind of pigeonholed me into being a really you know, a lovely, well-meaning person who must not have a sense of humor. I don't know. It's I get a lot of strange reactions, I think, because, and I, I hope, I think it comes from, you know, not understanding what mm-hmm. it really is mm-hmm. and the need within the community. And frankly, I hope you never have to understand because, you know, I don't understand other health conditions. You know, my son doesn't live with sickle cell or anything like that. And I say that because until you live with these things, you really don't know. Yeah. But within the diabetes community, there was so much humor and fun and snarkiness and, uh, you know, in, intelligent, wonderful, fascinating people. And it's like any other podcast. You know, people say, have said to me, how do you come up with topics week after week? Like, what do you have to talk about after a while? Like, Are you kidding? There's so much interesting and fun. And, and I don't talk about my son. It's not a personal show where I say, here's what we did and here's what worked. Or here. I, I share some stories sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like he's getting, if he passes, he's getting his driver's license soon. And when you have a person whose blood sugar can drop, you have to, there's rules and things and conversations that have to happen around that. So I've shared some of that, but it's his personal life. So I don't go into great detail. The show is about the news in diabetes land. It's not about Benny. That's not fair to him. So what is there to talk about? Oh my gosh. Don't feel bad for me. It's awesome. There'll never be a shortage of stuff to talk about. No, I mean, you know, I, and I, it might, that might sound kind of weird. I mean, I hope there's a cure for type one diabetes someday. I'd like to put myself out of business, but in the meantime, man, there's a lot to talk about and there's not a lot of places to hear it. Mm. So I feel like I'm, I'm able to, to get through to people. There's two people I haven't been able to talk to yet in the diabetes community that I'm, I'm going to get there. And Sonia Sotomayor, the Supreme Court Justice lives with type one. So I've put my requests in. There's a press office. They have to talk to me. I know who these people are. So I'm knocking on their door. And Nick Jonas. Nick Jonas, okay. Nick Jonas. So which one will be harder to get? And who will make more demands about who, when they come on, what they want? Uh, So I'm a big proponent of like putting intentions out into the universe. And it's, I've had them go out several times on this show. And, uh, a couple of them have come true. So now that you've put them out there, the other Oh, thing, I'm going to get them both. <laughs> I'm going to get them both, Harry. Have you come actually on. posted that like on a, on a social platform to say, hey, I'm looking, if anyone can connect me with these two people. Yeah, I okay. have. And I, I actually have a lot. Of, I have other friends working. I know this is, this is going to sound terrible. I'm busy, right? <laughs> I'm trying to do all these things. So every once in a while, I'll send some emails out. Like yeah. What I need to do is sit down and just hammer it out and get to the right people. Yeah. And I really will do it. But again, putting my listeners first, these are great interviews and they'd be fun to do. But I'll be honest with you, talking to Nick Jonas is going to be fun and interesting. It's not going to help my people as much as talking to a group that's trying to pass legislation to lower the price of insulin. Mm. I mean, it's really interesting or to teach them things that they don't know. You know, I have an endocrinologist who came on and did the top 10 things that I get woken up about in the middle of the night. Right. Here's the top 10 calls I get from yeah, student yeah. parents. Okay. So they're actually going to learn more from that yeah, and get more from that from Nick Jonas. 
Nick, call me. It's okay. I don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean I, she doesn't want to hear from you, Nick. Right. So <laughs> doesn't mean you're not valuable. You're a wonderful resource. Come on the show. Well, Stacey, thank you so much for this wide ranging conversation. Who, who knew we had so much in common? With, uh... It's so funny. Yeah. So we've got to look everything up that way. And if you ever get back to Yonkers, we'll. Uh... Uh, yeah, we, uh, my, my partner and I drove there. I'm in Minneapolis now and we went there to see my parents for Thanksgiving. So, wow. and we'll, we'll probably get back there sometime in the spring. Yeah, it's completely different. And yeah, got to go into the city for a little bit, but that's New York City is not coming back probably for like another year as yeah. well. So there's no rush to get over there or even look at anything maybe semi-permanently so but i'm glad we got the chance we i know there are a couple of hiccups as they usually are with podcast scheduling <laughs> and you could probably relate to that as well no doubt no doubt but oh, uh, thanks for having me yeah it was, it was really great conversation and you do have the book is there anything else that you've got coming up that we, you want to let folks know about yeah I, I actually am dipping my toe into teaching a little mm, bit okay. so you can follow me on social i'm stacy sims s-t-a-c-e-y s-i-m-m-s mm -hmm. And I'll be posting, and at my website, stacysims.com, I'll be posting about a podcast course about making money in podcasting, get paid Good. to podcast, and to do it ethically. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of tips and tricks that I've helped people with privately, and mm -hmm. I want to get out there more. So I'm actually just starting that this year. The first one will be in February. There's another one coming this summer. And I'm really excited about it. We'll see what happens. But I've helped a lot of people already. And I thought this would be a more organized way to do it, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I think you've given me some of those links already in the sign up form. And we'll make sure we have them all. We can get them in, into the show notes. Thank you. So we'll have those listed for you. Thanks again for sharing your story. I appreciate you coming on and uh, all the best with the podcast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks again to Stacy for coming on the show. Always appreciated and did learn a lot about Stacy and her background in journalism and how that's translated into her being a successful podcast host. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Check out his fantastic music at cedarsoil.com. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite, and their awesome line of gear, specifically the Scarlet 2i2 Pro. Get more details at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at fullcast.co forward slash chat 15. Tune in next week for my conversation with Rachel Cook, host of Promote Yourself to CEO, another fantastic and powerful conversation with someone who's got a lot of experience in the coaching world. And if you made it this far, you're no doubt looking for this week's retention hashtag. Let's go with journalist Stacy. That's journalist and Stacy S-T-A-C-E-Y. You can tag Stacy at Stacy Sims, S-T-A-C-E-Y-S-I-M-M-S, -S and podcast underscore junkies. Thanks for all you do to support the show. Talk to you next week.